Good morning and welcome to Emmanuel. We're glad that you're here to worship with us. Uh, we want to extend a warm welcome to all of our visitors who are here and those who are watching via live stream. Pray the Lord's blessings upon us as we worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I just wanted to thank you all um, the, on behalf of the consistory. Thank you for your prayers and your support and your patience with us as we seek to uh, lead uh, Emmanuel and his people uh, in his ways and seek his wisdom during these uh, unusual times. Uh, if you have any questions regarding the actions that have been taken by the consistory, please uh, contact your parish elder. They'd be happy to talk to you. And I uh, just want to say as your pastor that we do uh, what we do uh, through prayer and through good conversations and brotherly love uh, for the sake of you, for all of us, out of charity and love for one another. As we'll see in a little bit, that we are to owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. And so that's our heart's desire in what we are doing and what we have been uh, deciding lately. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 145, where we hear these words. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. As we come before our great and awesome God, the one who is highly exalted and greatly to be praised, let us do so in a word of silent prayer. Please pray with me. Gracious God and Father in heaven, as the psalmist continues, one generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts on the glorious splendor of your majesty, on your wondrous works, we will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds and will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O oh Lord God, we come on this Lord's Day that you have blessed us with to assemble and hear your word proclaimed and to declare your wondrous works and to do so with song and in prayer and in the hearing of your word. O oh Lord God, we pray that you would be glorified and exalted, that the name of Jesus may be lifted high, for it's in his precious name that we pray and all God's people said. Amen. Congregation, please stand with me if you are visiting with us. If you have a bulletin, there, morning worship service order, there's a responsive reading that we say together as a congregation. Congregation, our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our hearts shall rejoice in him because we have trusted in his holy name. Let your mercy, O Lord, be upon us just as we hope in you. Dear people of God, receive the greeting of God. Grace, mercy, and peace be yours in abundance from God our Father and from his Son and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and operation of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, let us now sing a hymn of praise by turning in our songbook to 145C, I Will Exalt You, O My God. We'll sing all the stanzas.
I invite you to turn in your Bibles with me to Colossians chapter 3 for the reading of God's law, turning to the New Testament scripture reading for the reading of the law, found at uh, chapter 3, beginning at verse 1, and I'll read through verse 17. Paul's letter to the Colossian church, he emphasizes the supremacy and preeminence of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is God in flesh. He is the fullness of the divine being in human flesh. He is truly human and truly God. And as Paul so often does after giving a exposition, a theological exposition of who Christ is in the first couple of chapters, he speaks to the application of that theology, of what we are to uh, believe and how we are to apply uh, such great uh, truth concerning the Lord Jesus Christ and who he is and what he, he has done for us. So our reading beginning at verse 1 of chapter 3. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. By the reading of God's word from Colossians chapter 3, uh, brothers and sisters in the Lord, we read this passage because... As we evaluate our own hearts and lives, we recognize how far short we come from fulfilling God's law, the law of love, to love God and to love one another. And what a blessing it is to have the privilege to come before God our Father in the name of Christ, seeking his forgiveness, seeking his mercy, knowing that his promise is true, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. This is a wonderful promise, and we're going to sing now, 278, What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. It's the blood of Jesus that we hold on to in faith, looking to his cleansing power for the forgiveness of sins. Let us now turn to 278. We will remain seated as we sing this hymn.
Next week, Sunday, Lord willing, we will celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. And at this time, we want to examine our hearts and reflect upon the meaning and the purpose of the Lord's Supper as it relates to our spiritual nourishment as we receive the body and blood of Christ. So I encourage you to turn in the Forms and Prayers book to page 44, and I'll be reading the preparatory exhortation, page 44 in the Forms and Prayers book. Dear congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, since we hope next Lord's Day to celebrate the blessed sacrament of the Lord's Supper, we are called to prepare our hearts by rightly examining ourselves. For the Apostle Paul has written, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Therefore, you should examine your life. And considering your own sin and the wrath of God against it, be sure that you humble yourself in repentance before God. Examine your heart to be sure that you trust in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation, believing that your sins are forgiven wholly by grace because of our Lord's sacrifice on the cross. Finally, examine your conscience to be sure that you resolve to live in faith and obedience before your Lord and in love and peace with your neighbor. God will surely receive at the table of his son all who truly repent of their sins, believe in Jesus Christ as their savior, and desire to do his will. All those, however, who do not repent, who, put, who do not put their trust in the Lord Jesus, and have not, no desire to lead a godly life, are warned according to the command of God to keep themselves from the holy sacrament. If any one of us is living in disobedience to Christ and in enmity with his neighbor, he must repent of his sin and reconcile himself to his neighbor before he comes to the Lord's table. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. This solemn warning is not designed, however, to discourage penitent sinners from coming to the Holy Sacrament. We do not come to the supper as though we were righteous in ourselves, but rather to testify that we are sinners and that we look to Jesus Christ for our salvation. Although we do not have perfect faith, do not serve and love God with all our hearts, and do not love our neighbors as we ought, we are confident that the Savior accepts us at his table when we come in humble faith, with sorrow for our sins, and with a will to follow him as he commands. And since it is necessary for us to come to the sacrament in good conscience, we urge any who lack this confidence to seek from the minister or any elder of this church such counsel as may quiet his conscience or lead to the conversion of his life. All then, who are truly sorry for their sins, who sincerely believe in the Lord Jesus as their Savior, and who earnestly desire to lead a godly life, ought to accept the invitation now given and come with gladness to the table of their Lord. This time we're going to have a word of prayer, and I will go into the congregational prayer as well. Let's, let us go before our Father. Almighty God, who has given us the gospel of Jesus Christ and provided a most wonderful communion with him through the mystery of the sacrament, we need your grace to enable us to prepare our hearts for the reception of Holy Communion. To all who sincerely believe in your Son and truly repent of their sins, grant assurance of your gracious readiness to receive and bless them in the supper of their Lord. To all who have not yet repented and have not put their trust in the Lord Jesus, grant a restraining fear of this supper, lest their condemnation be greater. But have mercy upon these, and grant them grace to repent of their sins and seek their salvation in your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We confess, O oh Father, that we have all offended your majesty and all deserve your judgment. We have transgressed in our thoughts, our words, and our deeds. Truly, there is no strength in us. Please be merciful, O oh God, to us, and grant us your pardon. And let us come to the sacrament next Lord's Day in the joy of your forgiving love.
Oh, Father, we cling to the promise of forgiveness of sins. We cling to Christ, who is the promised Messiah, who came and died and rose again from the dead victoriously, who died for sinners and gives new life through the power of his resurrection and the power of his spirit, creating new life and eternal hope in our hearts. Oh, Lord God, we pray that your hope would be upon your people so that in this world with devils filled who threaten to undo us, oh Lord, we look to your word of promise, for it is truth. In this world, oh Lord, where there are lies and deception, we look to your word of truth. And help us, oh Lord, to, to love you, to love your word, and seek after Christ daily, and to learn to love one another you have called us to. Oh, Father, do a work in our hearts, we pray. Grant us the grace of sanctification to grow in the wisdom and knowledge of our Savior Jesus, to walk in his ways, not our own, to put to death the deeds of the flesh, those sins that easily entangle us and deceive us. Oh, Father, we pray that we would be a community of faith truly really desires to love one another as you have called us. And that we would look up to you, the giver of every good and perfect gift, with thanksgiving in our hearts and singing praise to your awesome name. Oh, Lord, you are doing a work in this world. You are drawing many to repentance and faith according to your electing love. Oh, Lord, we thank you that we as a church can be a part of this work that you have called us to as we seek to be obedient to the preaching of the gospel and living lives worthy of the calling, proclaiming the name of Christ, the only Savior and Lord, calling people to repent and turn to him for salvation, for mercy, and for hope. Especially in this world where there is so much hopelessness, so much deceit, and so much dismay. Oh Lord God, help us as a people to be strong in you, strong in your spirit, and to walk in your ways. Father, we pray that your gospel would come for us your people here at Emmanuel, those who are going through physical trials, we continue to pray for Kathy Piper as she has her spinal stimulator put in this week. We pray, oh God, that you would grant wisdom and guidance to the physicians and, and that this, oh Lord, would help her in her chronic pain and alleviate that pain, we pray. We pray, oh Lord, for Grace Vander Molen as she continues radiation treatment. We Pray for strength for her, and as you grant her, O oh Lord, all that she stands in need of, to continue to be strong in you. Pray, O oh God, for Peter Brummel. We thank you that he is recovering after having the virus. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to keep the Brummel family safe and in your care. We ask, O oh Lord, for your mercy to be upon others as well, those unspoken needs and hurts, physical trials that many are going through. But you know their trials, you know their pain, you know their heartache, O oh Lord. We ask for your tender mercy to be upon them, and that they may know your peace, which passes all understanding. And we pray also, O Lord, for those who are going through a spiritual desert. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would awaken them by your spirit and word and revive their hearts, and that the joy of your salvation would manifest itself in them, O oh God that they would turn to you and find their hope and comfort in Jesus. Father, we want to continue to pray for Carol Ohms. You would give her your peace and comfort as she's in the nursing home. And for all our elderly and senior saints, may you keep them, O oh Lord, in the palm of your hands as you have promised, Lord. And we thank you for that and that they may know your protection and preservation of their souls and their life in your hands, O oh Lord. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would 
bless your word as it is proclaimed today as we think about the importance of forgiveness in the Christian life. It's a very hard thing for us to do, to ask for forgiveness and to give forgiveness. Oh, Father, we pray that your mercy would be upon us as we hear the reading and preaching of your word and that you would illuminate our hearts and minds to grow in this area in our lives and that we would walk practicing forgiveness in a very real and tangible way and that you would reconcile broken relationships through forgiving one another. Oh Lord, we pray for our families of the church and those who are going through challenges of various kinds. We ask, Father, that your spirit, working through your word, would grant reconciliation and comfort and peace within the home. Oh Lord, we pray also for the word of God as it is proclaimed this morning and as your people hear it may be received with open ears and that, Lord, your word would bring transformation in our lives individually but in our families of the church and those who are watching via live stream and through the internet. We pray, oh God, that your word would bring transformation and transform lives and families, and that the families of this congregation and elsewhere would keep Christ centered in their homes and that they would grow in grace and in mercy towards one another. Oh Lord, we pray these things not because we are worthy, but because Christ alone is worthy, and we look to him the one who died and rose again, and who sits at your right hand, interceding for us even now. In his great name we pray. Amen. At this time, we're going to sing a song of preparation, 169. Master, speak, thy servant hear it. We're going to sing all the stanzas. Uh, the offerings and tithes will be received after the service, as all, all since we've been doing, we've been having the the baskets at each exit, you can place your offering there at that time. Our offering is for the general fund and for Ileana right to life as well. Let us now stand and sing 169 as we prepare our hearts to hear God's word.
scripture reading, I invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 6. I'll begin reading at verse 9 to verse 15, and then we'll go to Matthew chapter 18, verse 21 to 35. So we'll turn first to Matthew chapter 6. I'll begin reading at verse 9. Last week, we learned to pray, give us this day our daily bread, that is for our essential material needs. The fifth petition is a prayer for God's forgiveness of our debts as we forgive our debtors. Forgiveness is foundational to reconciliation with our Father in heaven and with one another. It's the Christian's duty to love our neighbor and forgive our neighbor. So that's what we're going to look at this morning. So beginning at verse 9 of Matthew chapter 6, let us now hear God's word. Pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now we turn to chapter 18, beginning at verse 21. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times, Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him ten thousand talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had, and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused, and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant, as I had mercy on you? And in anger his master delivered him to the jailers, until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you, if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. By the reading of God's holy word, may he add his blessing upon the, re- the preaching and teaching of it. Congregation of Christ. We pray, Father, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. This is illustrated beautifully in the parable of the unforgiving servant. At verses 21 to 22, if you have your Bibles open, please look with me at those verses. Peter asks, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times, Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy-seven times. Now some translations have their seventy times seven. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy times seven. Whether it's seventy-seven times or seventy times seven, translators are undecided about the meaning of this particular phrase. But we need to understand that the point is this. That whether it's 49 times or 490 times, we need to forgive 
always our brother or sister in the Lord or our neighbor. You see, this is a figure of speech that is being used here. It's a figure of speech that says we must always forgive. Forgive us our sins as we forgive our, our debtors, says the scriptures. But why does Peter bring up this question? Why does he bring it up? How many times must I forgive my brother who sins against me? Well, according to Jewish tradition, in those days, it was believed that a Jewish person was to forgive their brother up to three times. After three times, the fourth, fifth, sixth, so on and so forth, were not forgiven. And this comes from the tradition of men, from Jewish interpretation of the law. But contrary to the traditions of men, as Jesus so often points out, contrary to the traditions of men, Jesus instructs his disciples to always forgive your neighbor when they sin against you. And his teaching is consistent with the scriptures, with the entire Old Testament to love your neighbor as yourself, with the New Testament command to love your neighbor and to love your enemy. Jesus illustrates his answer to Peter's question beautifully in this parable of the unforgiving servant. And there are three scenes Three scenes in this parable here that address Peter's question. And I'm going to repeat that often because so often we miss the purpose of the parable. When we start going off into rabbit trails and start allegorizing every point of detail in the parable. The parable is about Peter's question and Jesus is answering it by illustrating it with this parable. So let's keep that in mind. Well, here's the first scene. The first scene is the merciful king cancels his servant's great death. And we, we see this in verses 23 to 27, don't we? There's a king, and he's ready to settle accounts with his servants in his kingdom. And one of his servants is brought before him. Give me what you owe. It's time to call in the debt. What does this man owe? 10,000 talents. 10,000 talents. One talent equals 20 years of a laborer's day wage. So if you lived 80 years of life, that's about four talents. Take about over 2,500 years to pay off his debt. Now, someone may correct me on my math here. Very possible. But the point again here is that he owed a lot of money, a great debt that in his life was not even coming close to being paid off by this man. Today this debt would be in the millions and millions of dollars, maybe even a billion dollars. You know, we don't know how we got this debt. We don't know the circumstances that surrounded it. But again, that's not the point. The point that Jesus is making is this man had a great Debt. That is the point. And this great debt cannot be paid off. And consequently, what happens? The king pronounces a just punishment upon his servant. Look with me at verse 25. And since he could not pay his master, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. Wow, this sounds cruel. This sounds harsh. The man and his family sold? Well, in those days, if you owed debt, you were sold to be slaves to pay off the debt. Obviously, today we don't practice this, but we are slaves to our lenders, our mortgage holders. We are slaves in other ways to those who we owe money to. But back then, the whole household was sold to pay off the debt because the man, this man, was the head of his household and all who were under him, even his possessions, 
and his wife and children were sold with him. And the king was perfectly just in his punishments. Because of the punishment, what does the debtor do? He drops to his knees, imploring him, pleading with him. He says, verse 26, the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. The word there, have long suffering for me. We've talked about this word before, long suffering. In other words, Hold off on your anger and wrath against me until I pay off everything. Don't punish me. Postpone your anger towards me. But this is impossible because the king knows that he can never pay this great debt. And out of pity, out of compassion, Mercy, what does the king do? The king forgives the debt. He releases his servant. Verse 27, and out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him that debt. He showed mercy to a poor, miserable debtor who came begging for mercy. And instead of punishing him justly, he shows compassion towards the debtor. And he cancels his servant's debt and any punishment that comes along with it. The man is freed. He's released. Free to go. And there's no hesitation by the king. Friends, this is mercy on the part of the king. It is said that justice is getting what you deserve. Mercy is getting what you don't deserve. Young people, think about that. Children, justice is getting what you deserve. Mercy is getting what you don't deserve. And we see this played out even in the home. When parents discipline their children, and there's, a, there's a, a sin that takes place. And out of mercy, the parents disciplines, but doesn't harshly punish the child. He has pity on the child and mercy on the child. Now you would think that the forgiven debtor would leave the king's presence with such gratitude in his heart such joy in his heart for what just happened. 10,000 talents forgiven. You would think that he would be ecstatic, excited, wet, waiting to show mercy and forgiveness to another. But the opposite happens. And then there's scene two. The second scene of the parable is the forgiven servant refuses to cancel his neighbor's debt. Look with me at verse 28. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. One denarius equals only a day's wage. So he owed about three and a half months worth of a laborer's wage. And what's his reaction? What's his reaction? He goes after his throat. He goes after his throat here. This man owed an immensely small number compared to the great innumerable number of debt that the forgiven servant owed his master. It's time for this man to show mercy and forgive a fellow servant who's indebted to him. But he goes for his throat. Now, this isn't a business seminar by Jesus. Jesus isn't advocating here a, a business practice of canceling everyone's debt who comes to you pleading. Obviously, there are ways to deal with that from a business perspective. That's not the point. Again, 
Let's keep our eyes on the purpose of the parable. How many times must I forgive my brother who sins against me? And in verse 28, verse, uh, second section of that, he says, And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe. Before the debtor said a word, the forgiven servant mercilessly attacks the man. His neighbor, his debtor, shows no compassion and is very cruel and harsh toward his fellow servant. He wasn't a man who showed any inner change in his own heart after receiving mercy from his master. What is it? He isn't a man who shows any change after receiving grace, unmerited favor for his own debt from his master. And look how the fellow servant responds. He responds almost exactly the same way that the forgiven servant responded to his master. So his fellow servant, verse 29, fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. Have patience. Be long-suffering towards me. Towards me. What does he do? He refuses him. He's cold towards him. He puts him in prison. No mercy for you. No compassion for you. You're going to prison and you're going to pay every last penny. Every last penny. This man was released from his own debt and he refuses to absolve the debt of his fellow servants. This man was pardoned by his master and he refuses to show grace to a poor, miserable debtor. What does it say about the man's heart? He crushes any hope of reconciliation here. And let's remember the purpose of the parable. How many times must I forgive my brother who sins against me? This man wouldn't forgive one person. He's down to zero. He's down to zero. Then we come to the third scene. The just king punishes the unforgiving servants. The merciful king receives news from his servants that this man whom he forgave treated ill one of his fellow servants who owed him money. And this greatly angered and displeased the king, the master. And verse 35 and following, when the master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him up to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. He calls the servant a wicked servant. He's a scoundrel. A scoundrel who refused to have mercy on his neighbor. Again, the purpose of the parable. Because verse 34 seemingly teaches that a person can lose their salvation if one interprets it that way. That is, we don't, if we don't show mercy to our neighbor then we will be punished for our debt. How can that be? If he forgave us of our debts, how can he then place his debt back upon us and punish us for that debt? Again, we need to go to the purpose of the parable. And the purpose of the parable is forgiving others and have mercy on others, which Jesus sums up at verse 35. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. You see, his heart reflected that he was not truly repentant. He was not truly contrite. What will his Heavenly Father do if you or I don't forgive your brother, our brother from our hearts? You or I will not be forgiven of our debts and therefore not receive mercy and grace. We will be punished eternally for our sins. You see, a heart that has been changed by God's mercy 
It's manifested in the way that we show mercy to one another. That's what Jesus teaches in the Beatitudes in chapters 5 through 7 in Matthew. Father, forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Just as you forgive, give us grace and mercy to forgive one another, reflecting the mercy and grace that we have received from your fatherly hand, from your mercy. You see, these three scenes drive home Jesus' point, the duty to forgive and show mercy always. Always, always forgive, always show mercy. This doesn't mean that there are no consequences to someone's actions because a man reaps what he sows. But we are called to make peace with one another as far as we can. Go to make peace, forgiving one another as Christ has forgiven us. This parable beautifully illustrates our, our prayer to the Father. When we say, Father, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now let me kind of open this up a little bit more and get to points of application. We'll shed more light on what's be, being taught here by our Lord Jesus Christ. On their points of application, praying for forgiveness, forgive us our debts. Like the servant in the first scene of the parable here. We are poor sinners, poor debtors who owe an enormous, great debt to God. An unpayable debt. Our sins are so great that we cannot pay them. They're great in number. And only God can mercifully forgive our debts. Friends, we became debtors from the womb in original sin. And we daily accrue debts with our actual sin. And with contrition and sorrow in our hearts, the true disciple of Jesus pleads for mercy and forgiveness. Pleads before our God and Father through Jesus Christ to forgive us of our sins. Forgive us of our debts. It comes from the heart. A heart that's been renewed and transformed by the Holy Spirit. And when we pray, Father, forgive us our debts, we ask God to forgive us for the sake of His Son. See, Jesus' mission was to come to seek and to save the lost, to save sinners, to save the sick and not the healthy, to save sinners and not the self-righteous who think that they are good and they have no debt before God. Friends, our debt needs to be paid off and wiped clean. And the great news for us, the great news is that Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid off our great debt on the cross where he shed his precious blood. Nothing but the blood of, Christ, of Jesus can wash away my sins, can wash away your sins. Nothing but the blood. He shed his precious blood for our sins, and not only that, he suffered the punishment for our sins before a just God, so that you can stand before him righteous in his sight, released from the bondage of sin and death and hell. Is that not good news? It is great news for you and me. Great news. Listen to what Paul says in Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. And you were dead in your trespasses and this uncircumcision of your flesh. God made alive with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. Now trespasses, debts, transgressions, all under sin or sins. The trespass is to cross the line, to cross the line, to go over the line. We have crossed the line of God's word, offending God and his majesty. We have not, have not done what his law demands. 
We have trespassed against him. But Jesus canceled the record of death that stood against us with its legal demands. He took the punishment for our sins, our debts, so that we can be released. This he set aside, Paul says, nailing it to the cross. At the cross where the Savior bled, God's justice was satisfied. God's mercy was poured out for you and me, debtors to God. Perhaps you've never prayed for forgiveness. Perhaps you prayed, Father, forgive us our debts. But it was just meaningless to you. Maybe it was just mechanical. Maybe you just did it because your parents did it at the dinner table. Or maybe you just did it because you, you said it in church, but it had no meaning for you. Is that you? Do you know what it means to ask the Lord for forgiveness? Maybe you believe God owes you mercy. God owes you forgiveness. God owes you grace. Or maybe you think you deserve it. Justice is getting what you deserve. Mercy is getting what you don't deserve. And we don't deserve God's mercy. And yet he is mercy. His justice was satisfied at the cross. And his mercy is poured out upon us Christians in our hearts. And if you have not repented of your sins and turned to Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. I urge you to do that now. Acknowledge that you are a debtor. You are a sinner in need of a Savior. Trust in His mercy. Trust in His sacrifice on the cross for your sins. Look to Him alone for forgiveness. And that He conquered death by rising from the dead. Many of you may be thinking, oh, I've heard this over and over again. But you know what? Some may have had their ears closed for years about it. And maybe the Spirit needs to open up some ears this morning. So when you pr pray, Father, forgive us our debts, what are you praying? Do you know what you're praying? God does not hesitate to forgive and show mercy to a broken and contrite sinner. Come to Jesus. Believe on Him and you shall be saved. But the opposite is true as well. What do I mean? In theologically conservative and pietistic churches, one author says a poverty of righteousness becomes a sort of riches. Calling oneself a poor sinner gains one the esteem of fellow Christians. This commentator illustrates what he talks about or what he means by this, by giving a story of a woman who, in order to demonstrate her piety, told Charles Spurgeon that she was a very bad sinner. With deep sighs, she insisted that she was the greatest of all sinners, worse than Paul and not worthy to be called a Christian. Quite bored with her whining, Spurgeon said, You did not need to tell me all that, madam, because I knew it already. Other people have told me what a sinner you are. Then the penitent sinner flared up. How does anybody dare say such a thing about me? Who said it? She isn't the only insincere person in the church. But there are opposites. There are those who do not recognize that they need forgiveness and mercy. And there are those who are ultra-pietistic and a poverty of righteousness becomes a sort of riches. Well, secondly, practicing forgiveness as we forgive our debtors. The wonderful mercy and forgiveness of God inclines us, his disciples, to freely forgive and show mercy toward his neighbor. Our debts or sin committed against one another, though painful, are small. 
small in comparison to our sins before our Father in heaven. And it's the gospel or the good and great news of God's mercy that shows sinners how to forgive sinners. Listen again. Listen again. It's the great news of God's mercy that teaches sinners how to forgive sinners. Reconciliation with our neighbor occurs when we come to the table, own up to our sins, ask for forgiveness, and each disciple of Jesus Christ forgives or has mercy upon their neighbor, their brother and sister. In fact, this is in the previous context of our passage in verses 15 and 20. Oh, pastor, that sounds too ideal. We don't live in a perfect world. No, we don't live in a perfect world. But be careful when we start saying those things because then we are trying to justify, justify why we are not trying to show mercy to one another. One author says, Prompted by gratitude, the forgiven sinner must always yearn to forgive whoever has trespassed against him and must do all in his power to bring about complete reconciliation. All in his power. As the Apostle Paul says in Romans, do all that you can to make peace with one another. That's what it means as we forgive our debtors, when we pray that prayer, we are practicing forgiveness. Jesus commands his disciples to be merciful as your heavenly Father is merciful. You see, the mark of a true disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ practices forgiving others, showing mercy and compassion to the one who has offended him or her. Transform sinners. By God's grace and mercy, show the fruits of mercy in their lives. Because it's a work of God and His Spirit. It's a work of God in the heart of the born again believer, transforming hearts and minds of His people. Listen to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. It's hard. But we are called to take the initiative. Oh, no one, anything except love each other. Now this doesn't mean that we forgive perfectly. Only God forgives perfectly. But we are called to forgive willingly and readily. And in fact, it is a test by the Lord, when trials of these kinds come our way, when we need to engage in a, the process of reconciliation, when we need to engage in forgiveness and asking for forgiveness, this is a test of discipleship. Will we willingly and readily forgive? At the end of the Lord's Prayer, Jesus adds, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive your trespasses. It doesn't mean that the Father's forgiveness depends on whether you and I forgive my neighbor, our neighbor. If this were the case, none of us would be forgiven. What it does mean that children imitate their Father in Heaven. That we are to be merciful as our Father in Heaven is mer merciful. And to reflect what He is doing in our own hearts and minds through the power of the Gospel. Rather, when we are merciful to our brothers, we are being assured of the mercy of God in our own hearts. We are being assured of God's forgiveness and mercy. When we practice forgiving others for the sake of Jesus and His name. This brings much light to the scripture verse, he who has been forgiven much, loves much. How much do you love your brother and sister? How much do you love your neighbor? 
the length that you will go, the length that I will go to extend mercy and grace to our brother and sister determine how much you and I love them. Let us, brothers and sisters, make it a practice to pray daily for forgiveness in Jesus' name. And let's make it a practice to practice forgiving one another in Jesus' name. Amen. Our Father in heaven, we come before you thanking you for your sovereign mercy in our lives. We confess that we deserve punishment for our debts, but we, O oh Lord, look not to ourselves but we look to Jesus Christ alone for forgiveness. We look to you, O oh God, the one who releases us from our debt, frees us from the bondage of sin and death, gives us new life and hope, transforms our hearts to seek after you. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would grant us mercy be able to show mercy to one another. May the work of your Spirit abound in our lives so that we will be merciful as our Father in Heaven is merciful. May we, O oh Lord, always be ready to seek peace and reconciliation with our neighbor for the sake of unity, for the sake of the Gospel. That many would see our love for one another and our faith and our good works that are done for your glory and honor and glorify our Father in heaven. Oh, Father, we pray that you would build us up, encourage us, and strengthen us to walk in a manner worthy of the calling, to walk in mercy and in grace toward our fellow neighbor. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this time we're going to turn to number 179, Forgive Our Sins As We Forgive. We'll stand to sing all the stanzas. Now the benediction, the Lord's blessing as we depart this place. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit being about with you now and forevermore. Amen.